the man behind the exit polls, Warren Matowski, very respected in this business, is one of the key people who wrote the rules of ethics that are right here in my drawer. One of those rules is transparency. I've talked to Warren Matowski, and he said to me, well, it's proprietary data. In spite of repeated requests, Edison Matowski refused to release the raw data to researchers and colleagues. It's not proprietary data at all. And one of the difficulties I have is that lay it all out on the table. Let's see what happened. The only data that we have is the data that's in the Matowski Edison report. And that's a summarized data. When you have the raw data, you have a lot more opportunity to do analysis. And the fact that we don't have that says a whole lot. It is very much a reason why we should investigate this election. After the election, statisticians continued to analyze data to see if there were patterns to the widespread exit poll discrepancies. In the battleground or swing states, according to the exit polls, Kerry was ahead in 10 of the 12 states. The final tallies showed Kerry taking just five of the 10 states in which he had been ahead. When the final tallies were compared with figures before the exit polls had been adjusted, researchers noted that in 11 of the 12 states, regardless of the winner, there was a red shift away from exit poll results towards George Bush. The polls now no longer match the results on election day on the machines, and that is very disquieting to me because there's got to be a reason for that. I want to know why. Stories about irregularities with the 2004 election did begin to appear on the internet, on progressive TV shows, and in local papers. But mainstream networks and national newspaper chains continued to remain silent. Frankly, I put off writing about the election because, like everybody else in the country, if there's a real problem, why isn't it in the newspapers? Nobody had picked up any stories. Um, the only times we'd seen something were a couple articles in the New York Times saying loonies on the internet say that, you know, votes had been switched, something like that. We were furious. I can see the decline in journalism uh, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal, especially on the editorial page. And you would have expected the Wall Street Journal to see an opportunity in a story such as the disparity between the exit polls and the vote count that was being neglected by the so-called uh, mainstream or corporate media. The investigations of 2004 and the vote loss, the ballots that were never counted, we reported this all over the planet, and we could not get this on US TV for anything. We tried, believe me, we tried, and it was simply not permitted. How do you counter this e enormous force, the incredible amount of money and resources that they have? The people became the fourth estate. It was the folks on the internet who found uh, a great number of the irregularities that Lord only knows if they would have been discovered at all if it hadn't been for these, uh, I call them this, this army of citizen patriots who were looking at these things, trying to figure it out. Now, that said, there's only so much that bloggers and folks on the internet can actually do. We need the mainstream media to get down there, to get on the ground, to talk to officials who won't talk to us, who won't call me back, but who might call the New York Times back, and to find out what actually happened. I remember in this country we used to call spin lying. Now we call it spin and we study it and we admire it. How to put out a line of bull and have it fly for more than 24 hours, that's the ultimate power in, in a political realm, is, is controlling perceptions.
People often wonder if there has been an evaluation of what actually happened in 2004 and uh, any kind of post-mortem uh, forensic analysis of the machines. And not only hasn't there been one, but there couldn't be one. These machines are fully electronic. If there's any code in the machines by design that would change votes from one candidate to another, that code could erase itself. Uh, there would be no trace. Well, Bob, if you could walk us through how this electronic voting works, if, oh, if you could. Okay, John. After the voter has made his, or from what I understand, in some states, her on-screen selection, <laughs> the information is converted from the complex English language, such as this, to this simple binary code. This server processes the information and tells you who won. But how do you know that the server is correct? It is possible to manipulate votes on a very massive scale with a low probability of detection. And the reason uh, that's true now is a result of the advance of technology. One of the things that we've done in penetration tests is come in and attach a wireless access point behind a copier somewhere and then sit out in the parking lot uh, and access network resources from outdoors. I changed, I think, 13,000 votes with a, a sample uh, database taken from an old election. Um, and in my speed hacking the vote, uh, I changed something like 1.6 million votes um, just to show that it could be done. There's really no limit to the number of votes you can change. A major study released in 2006 concluded that all commonly used voting systems are susceptible to tampering. The Brennan Report, compiled by a panel of computer and election experts, plainly states the threat analysis shows that machines with wireless components are particularly vulnerable to software attack programs and other attacks. Machines record our votes, machines tally our votes, and we are, of course, told to trust the machines. In spite of official assurances of accuracy and security, Voters find it difficult to trust machines when they can actually see their vote switch from one candidate to another. People tried to, to vote for Kerry and it flipped to Bush. So people ask me, is that possible? Would it be possible to program something like that? Well, absolutely. Vote switching not only overwhelmingly occurred in multiple jurisdictions, but also occurred on equipment programmed by different vendors. Something that favors one candidate that occurs all over the country and spans across equipment from multiple vendors is no simple accident. We have this stampede to embrace these machines. It ought to be the most critically important technology that exists in this country is the technology that we use to decide who will be our next leader. And it's junk. The machines themselves are a focus of concern, which leads to the question, who controls the software that tells the machines what to do? Mr. Curtis, would you please state your full name for the record? My uh, name is Clinton Eugene Curtis. In December 2004, a group of Congress members met to gather information about the technology used in the November election. One witness was Clint Curtis, a computer programmer, who testified about being asked to create vote-switching software. Mr. Curtis, are there programs that can be used to secretly fix elections? Yes. How do you know that to be the case? Because in October of 2000, I wrote a prototype for Congressman Tom Feeney. It would rig an election? It would flip the vote 51-49. And he was very specific on what he wanted. He wanted it to be touchscreen capable, which if you write it in Windows, it's XY coordinates, it's mouse movements, it's, it's done, no problem. He wanted it to be so you didn't have to have any third-party implements. You didn't have to sit across the street with a keyboard, you didn't have to bring something in, a little chip and insert it in the computer, nothing. He wanted so you could go to the screen, hit some hidden buttons, and flip the vote and decide who the winner is just by doing that. 